So why am I here? I'm here today because of one tweet I sent on the 15th of January, 2011. And that tweet simply said, arrive San Francisco. Not unlike other tweets I've done, because I like telling people where I am, because you never know quite what's going to happen next. And in this particular occasion, this is what happened next. Another Australian who I'd never met saw my tweet and said, I live here, let's catch up. We caught up, we had lunch down at Fisherman's Wharf. That led to me becoming the CEO of a company called Cred that does social media influence. And then a few years later, one of my clients became Taylor Nelson Software, one of the market research firms. And one of my clients became a guy called Raj Halabi, who later on left TNS to become a student here at the school. He introduced me to the dean, and I've spoken a couple of times at LBS functions. In fact, Karen Saba, who is here, was one of the other people he introduced me to. And here is where the magic happens. Karen and I are both on Foursquare. Foursquare is a social network where you check into places. And I noticed that Karen had checked into Unilever House across from where I work. So I rather cheekily put on her check-in, welcome to the neighbourhood, let's catch up, which we did. We had lunch. And she said, well, next year we're going to have another TEDx and we'd love you to apply. And she introduced me to Adam. So the only reason I'm here today is because of that one tweet I sent back in January 2011. And that is the magic of social. <laughs> but I could stop there, but you'd be shortchanged. What I want to talk about is how social has evolved. The fact that social media has actually been around for 2,000 years. There's a great book that's been written by the digital editor of The Economist, Tom Standage, called Writing on the Wall, Social Media, the First 2,000 Years. And in the book, Tom talks about uh, Marcus Cicero. He was a prolific writer, he was a politician, and we know this because some 900 of his letters have survived. And by looking at what he wrote and what he said, we saw that he used one of the first social networks, and that were his friends. If he'd been alive today, he would have been a politician that was lauded as a social media expert because he used the medium around to get messages around. And in 51 BC, he was sent away to be the governor in what is now uh, the era of southern Turkey. So he was outside of Rome. And this is the first century BC, so the time of Caesar. But he stayed connected with what was going on through his letter writing, through his social networks. What he and his peers were using back then was probably the very first evidence of Twitter and iPads. What you see here is a wax tablet, a bit like today's iPad. And the way it was used is a bit like Twitter, because what they would do is they'd etch a message on there to go across the city. A messenger would take it to the recipient. They would then rub out the wax, write their own response, and send it back. So the very early form of Twitter has actually been around for a couple of thousand years, which I find fascinating. Now we fast forward to the 1650s in London where coffee houses reign supreme. If you think Starbucks is on every corner in London, back then there were 500 coffee houses, actually more than public houses. And they became so popular because it was a place to go and to chat and to read pamphlets. They even became early post offices because London back then didn't have street numbers. So you would leave your post at the coffee house and then someone would come to collect it and that's how they communicated. Often people would come into the coffee house and they would scream, what news have you? And there'd be a discussion and a dialogue and it was a really popular place to go to have conversations and to spread messages. It's uh, talked about the fact that the term gravity was actually first coined in one of these coffee house discussions. But this phrase that gets yelled at is a bit like what we see on Facebook when you see what's on your mind. So 2,000 years later, we're still being asked the question to start that conversation. Let's fast forward to the present day. This is a picture I took back in 2012 at my local Starbucks. There are 14 people in this photograph. If you look closely, 11 of them are actually on another device. And my clicker is not working. Here we go. One, two, three, count them all, four, five, help me here, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven people on a social network, in a social network. Kind of crazy in the modern day. Back in uh, 1675, though, Charles II actually got very concerned about these coffee houses. They were becoming a real threat to his monarchy, and he uh, issued a proclamation saying, very evil and dangerous effects for that in such houses, divers false, malicious, and are devised and spread abroad to the defamation of his majesty's government and to the disturbance of the peace and quiet of the realm. A month later, he repealed that because he was reminded that the tax on the coffee and the chocolate and the tea was actually propping up the economy. 
I was in Istanbul about three weeks ago and I tried to go to Twitter.com and this is what I saw. The Turkish government had tried to block Twitter and a week later, it had ended. Because no matter whether you're in the 1600s or the 2000s, people love to communicate and they love to be able to do that using social networks. But fast forward to when we had steam and electricity and you had printing presses and mass media like television came about. This is when social media started to be suppressed because you had a broadcast mechanism and you had governments able to put their messages out through mass media and we're all tuned to different channels. And so what we saw was social media actually becoming less important. But more recently with technology and mobile and Twitter and Facebook, social media has come back to where it's always been. And what's happened is that consumers have become extremely empowered. I could tweet from the stage right now about a brand and make them very, very nervous. And I've done it before. And that's another story. But I want to introduce you to the consumer of the future. Her name is Madeline Grill, and she's my beautiful seven and a half year old daughter. And this picture, ironically, was taken at the same Starbucks that you saw before. I looked across, and Madeline was looking at the reviews of an app called Dream Pet House. So I looked across to Madeline and I said, Darling, what are you doing? Daddy, I'm looking at reviews on this app. It's really good, we should get it. Okay, <laughs> why are you looking at reviews? Well, when mummy's on Amazon and she's looking for stuff, she looks at reviews and we should get it. It's really, really good. So here you have a seven-year-old child who has never met people that are actually putting these reviews on. She is getting her influence on purchase decisions through people she's never met. And certainly when I was the CEO of Cred, I saw firsthand how people, ordinary people, can start influencing purchase decisions. I've been in advertising for a long time and I no longer read ads because I know how it works. I'd rather speak to one of my friends, someone in my network who's actually used a product and likes or dislikes it. So I will always go to my social network and that's why the influence of social has become so much more important. Now back in 2010, McKinsey actually looked at how the marketing funnel has become a loyalty loop. And in the outer loop here, you've got the evaluate. This is where social comes into its own. And I and you go and look for people that have tried products and they're recommending them. And what brands are looking for, the Nirvana, is to have someone in that loyalty loop so you never leave and they actually stay there. And my view is that in a few years' time, the power of the television commercial will decline because we all know that these ads are make, made to um, want us to buy things. But I'd rather talk to someone who's really used the product and tell me, can tell me if it works or not. So let's now look forward to the social networks of the future. This is a picture, obviously, of a production line. Back in those days, you all had access to the same raw material, and those that were smart made some really amazing things out of things from electricity and steam. But the social network, in my view, will become the production line. It won't be what you know, it'll be what you share. And the most powerful social networks will actually exist inside companies and governments. Because when you have a company that's sharing knowledge between them, you have an amazing powerhouse. And so, I don't talk about social media anymore, I talk about social business. And a social business is an organisation whose culture and systems encourage networks of people to create business value. Notice I didn't mention Twitter or Facebook or likes or fans. It was about culture, it was about people, and it was about business value. Now companies are just starting to wake up to this. That if they empower their employees, if they encourage them to share, who knows what's going to happen? because we've already seen the effect of it when it's used in external networks. And I can think of no better example of how a social network of the future can actually help save lives. Let me introduce you to Dr. Jeffrey Burns. He's the head of critical care for the Boston Children's Hospital. He's well known for helping critical ill children around the world, often from Boston Children's Hospital. And he became very frustrated because when he was dealing with some countries with bandwidth limitations and, and poor, poor internet, he wasn't able to get through. He believes that he and his peers have an obligation to share network and to share knowledge about how to save lives of critically ill children. And that's what he wanted to do. And one day he was actually watching the Masters Golf and he went to their website and he thought, this is interesting. You've got, what I'm seeing is actually the adult learning cycle. You've got an expert talking about what he does. He's a golfer. You're actually seeing him practice his swing then you're invited to actually try it yourself for the simulator, and then you're encouraged to share it with your network. And he said, this is the adult learning cycle. How can we apply technology to actually allow us to get that message out there and promote active learning and actually get people connected together? 
So together with IBM, they, connect, they um, developed a network called Open Pediatrics. And it has three main things that it does. First of all, it delivers information on demand. The second is a social network. So anyone on the network, and there are about 1,000 doctors in 17 countries, can actually share knowledge and share procedures about things. And the third thing is it actually encourages active learning. So you actually get to practice on these things and so the, the techniques can be perfected. So for me, the social networks of the future are ones that are actually going to save people's lives. That is the magic of social. Thank you.